My name's Andrew Zanatino, and I'd like to welcome you to the Adelaide Biomed City Mini Review webinar series. As you're aware, uh, these mini reviews have really been established to increase awareness of the many and varied types of research and capabilities that we have across the AOBMC precinct. But before I start, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians on the land in which we meet, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. I'd also like to remind you uh, that you can use the question and answer section of your Zoom window. Um, that allow me to relate the questions to the speaker and certainly would provide me with an opportunity not to have to think of one of those questions uh, off the top of my head. So help me out, please, audience. Uh, our first speaker for today is Professor Mark Hutchinson. Mark is the director of the Australian Research Council Centre for Excellence for Nanoscale Biophotonics and a professor at the University of Adelaide. He leads the Neuroimmunopharmacology Laboratory where they explore the fundamental science measurements and interventions of health and disease by exploiting the immunology of the brain and its relationship with the rest of the body. The title of his presentation today is Exploiting the Mind-Body Connection, Objective Measurements of Health and Disease. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Andrew. I want to acknowledge uh, the original custodians of the land that we meet on. Uh, I'm here in Adelaide and Ghana land. Uh, and I also want to pay respect to my team who I get to represent to do this amazing work. So my laboratory within the Neuroimmunopharmacology Group uh, and then my collaborators within the CNBP, um, the Centre for Nanoscale Biophotonics, the range of clinicians, industry uh, and other funding bodies that enable us to do this work. At the heart of it, what you have uh, access to within the Neuroimmunopharmacology Group here in Adelaide and the CNBP is a collection of tools and knowledge that you wouldn't usually see gathered together. Uh, and at the end of the day, what we are trying to achieve is the addressing of uh, the key element of years lived with disability. None of the works I work on, none of the uh, human uh, challenges or animal challenges I work on have to do with death as an endpoint, but rather they have to do with the years lived with disability. Uh, and specifically in my team, we are focusing a lot on the diseases of the central nervous system. So here you have the years lived with disability stats represented in two dimensions from the uh, world, uh, the global um, burden, disease burden data set. And 58% of the diseases which lead to years lived with disabilities are diseases that involve central nervous system dysfunction. Uh, also as a passion of mine is the diseases that are associated uh, or, or caused by pain with over three quarters of the challenge associated with um, problems of pain. Now, what you can view this is either an opportunity or, or a failure of Western medicine, um, and probably also a failure of how we have approached uh, these challenges in the past. These being um, uh, the classic Descartes approach of reductionist Western medicine, take the body apart, everything works nicely to, when you then uh, take it all apart and then you put it all back together and miraculously the body keeps working as it did in isolation. Uh, or uh, the Eastern approach, which is somehow miraculously, you do something to the peripheral ether of the body and then you get these miraculous events connected. Now, quite clearly, um, the two are incompatible in many ways. Um, and yet there are elements of the body as the garden approach, which the Descartes methods and, and principles that were written about 400 years ago, didn't actually uh, account for. Uh, and so we within the neuromenopharmacology team really ask the question uh, and, and rely on the fact that all behaviors, all outcomes um, from the physiological system rely on a cellular and molecular events, which should be able to be measured uh, and should be able to be interrogated. But critically, it's not just single units of these, but collections of these cellular and molecular events that come together to create uh, the complex states of well-being, wellness, uh, and as well as illness. So in the team, um, the, the projects that we run uh, fall into three key areas. We have a measurement program, uh, a development of novel interventions, uh, with then the identification of resilience parameters that will hopefully, if we can get the resilience part right, see an end 
of the need for the interventions, um, but perhaps we will continue to need to have optimised measurement technologies that bypass um, the illness to, to re result in resilience longer term. Uh, this means that we are working across precision medicine, so recovery from illness, uh, precision well-being to promote uh, a well-being state that means you're not actually sick when you need uh, when you have your interventions, uh, and then precision performance uh, around uh, creating augmented performance for certain uh, states. And I'll unpack that uh, just in a moment. The key part to our science uh, that we really utilise uh, from this perspective of merging together complex disease states, disease and trauma, uh, is the concept of the mind and the body being actually connected. Uh, and then the fact that um, whenever we deal with the complexities of psychological trauma or physical trauma, the, alter, the opposite, uh, the, the other um, uh, characteristic comes through. So the uh, psychological trauma can often present with a peripheral disease and peripheral disease clearly is associated with uh, psychological trauma. And yet going back to this challenge of the body is uh, a garden, we can't just work with ether. There has to be specific things that connect the mind and the body. Uh, and so within our group, we address this challenge um, and this unknown factor by asking yet another question. And that is basing a lot of our work on how do we know we are sick? Uh, so when we are thinking about illness and immune responses uh, to virus, bacteria, uh, damage, reactive oxygen species, radiation exposure, uh, there is an immune response. And the immune response is not occurring in isolation from the brain and the brain's activity is not occurring, uh, operating in isolation from the immunology. And there is now an extensive body of literature, in fact, a beautiful paper from Yoni Kipnis's group just today uh, in Nature Immunology, looking at the immune to brain communication and brain to immune communication and the pathways that are involved in this. So here we have direct cellular uh, and cytokine uh, communication via the leaky parts of the brain, uh, direct near peripheral afferent uh, signaling from immune system to brain and specific migration of cells and Yoni Kipnis's work today, uh, gamma delta T cell migration into the meninges creating anxiety behaviours uh, and are sufficient for the creation of anxiety behaviours. So our work is really exploring how do we then create measurements of these states in four dimensions, both space and time, to be able to start unpacking what is happening in the physiological state so that we have a representation of not only the brain, but also the body to be able to provide greater diagnostic uh, information pointing to precision medicine, precision performance uh, and precision wellbeing. So just uh, one example that I can unpack briefly in the time available is that of pain. Uh, and if you haven't been to the art gallery lately, this is one of my favorite sculptures uh, that is in the main auditorium in the art gallery that I see here, uh, the representation of pain, uh, the, the expression of danger uh, from the, the body that is maladaptively responding um, to danger signals within, danger molecular signals within the body. If we think about that at a molecular level, we know that this is occurring out in the peripheral afferents uh, within the spinal cord, within the brain, uh, within higher brain centres, but also in other descending uh, modulatory uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. Meaning that there are a multitude of events, which if we could understand in an individual, we may be able to identify precise uh, four dimensionally targeted therapies, interventions which are unique to that person's type of danger response, uh, which is an opportunity uh, and a challenge. So within the team, we are now looking at harnessing this connected mind and body. Uh, clearly the microbiome is part of this. Clearly the immunology is a soluble factor or soluble factors that allow us to connect this, um, which is pointing to performance and resilience and wellbeing. The, the team are working across the ages, across the species in both aged illness, um, childhood development, but also in livestock, uh, and uh, defense applications 
and in elite sports. The beauty about the technologies we're applying are allowing us to start doing repeated measurements within individuals. So the individual is their own control, such that we really are ending up with uh, the right tool being used in the right way to make these measurements of uh, performance, pain, uh, depression, anxiety, cognitive performance, uh, and physical performance. Uh, the, the point about the right tool and the right way is that not all the tools we have in our um, biophotonics range of tools are the right things cost-wise, practicality-wise, um, and size-wise, uh, or uh, intervention uh, invasiveness-wise. Um, so we really do have to unpack with our end users uh, and partner cleverly the right technology uh, for the measurement. But in all of these cases, we are primarily targeting an immune signal uh, that is linked to a, a psychological state or a performance state. So I think, Andrew, that's used up my nine minutes. Um, thanks again to the team uh, for all they do, uh, the funding sources. And if any of this is of interest in terms of measurement, biomarkering, wellness, well-being, please let us know. Andrew. Mark, thanks so much for a fantastic presentation. Um, look, I would encourage those people who uh, have been interested by what Mark has presented today to make uh, contact with him. This is about engaging researchers from across the disciplines across the Adelaide Biomed City Precinct. So uh, Mark, in the interest of time, and given that we've had so many technical issues today, I would ask that uh, if people do have any questions that they approach you outside of this, uh, this, this afternoon's you. presentation. But look, thanks so much for your time. Thanks all. Cheers. Um, I'd like to now introduce our second speaker for this afternoon, and uh, that is Dr. Johan Virgins. Johan is a consultant cardiologist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and uh, Dr. Jones and Partners. His research is focused on translational preclinical and clinical imaging biomarkers using advanced invasive and non-invasive molecular imaging strategies to detect, track and predict disease at an early stage. As the Deputy Director of Medical uh, Machine Learning at the Australian Institute of Machine Learning, Australia's largest machine learning group, his main role is to connect world-class machine learning capabilities to the biomedical precinct here in Adelaide. Today, um, Johan's presentation is entitled Machine Learning in Medicine, Past, Present and Future. And I'd just like to remind people there are, is a Q&A button on the bottom of their panel if they do have any questions after Johan's presentation, we may have time for one. So uh, thanks, Johan. Thank you for um, inviting me and uh, I really like to um, show that Adelaide Biomed City is giving me the opportunity. I really get the opportunity to explore the clinical uh, facilities at Dr. Jones and the Royal Adelaide Hospital and combining it with research uh, at Samri and the University, which is really a unique situation, probably anywhere, uh, which I'm really proud of. Um, Past, present and future in eight minutes is, uh, is, is not so easy. Therefore, I've added some links to slides. So if people look at back, they can get links to longer and more elaborate presentations. Uh, but AI has had a long history since the 50s and um, it, it has had experienced several hypes, but also several AI winters because the hype uh, and the promise didn't deliver into um, something that is actually useful. However, this has changed now in recent uh, years uh, where we actually get useful applications uh, in driverless cars, in our phones, internet, uh, 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 you name it. So our future is going to be an augmented age, not only in your pocket like now, it's going to be really, you're going to be physically, perceptually, cognitively augmented uh, with all these different tools. So th life is really going to be difficult, uh, different for us and, and most likely for our children. And the opportunity really is now because there's a record um, funding in AI startups, but also by big companies into AI uh, research or um, uh, AI tools that help them deliver their products better. And also research institutions are really um, uh, investing uh, uh, largely in, in AI and applying it to different uh, fields. Uh, when I came to Adelaide, one of my... Uh, request was that I could engage with the Australian Centre for Visual Technologies, which is now Australian Institute for Machine Learning, uh, because there was this huge potential of connecting the biomedical precinct with the machine learning expertise that was largely unknown uh, by a lot of people in Adelaide. 
So I will, I will try to present that because that's really important to realize and for future work that we are really happy to help and push any area. Uh, and today I will uh, mention mostly uh, the medical applications. So we're one of six research institutes at the University of Adelaide. We're the largest machine learning group in Australia with 130 people and growing. And we're third in the world in publications in computer vision. AI has different sports, and one of the major sports is image analysis. And we rank third after these two universities that you can see on the bottom. Uh, and I saw that University of Berkeley and Stanford are getting new faculty to uh, up their ranks. So I hope we can um, uh, keep that third spot uh, for the coming years. Um, this year I've shown that we have a lot, we have developed a lot of methods in image analysis. So the, the, the Institute is really developing methods to analyze images for any other purpose. And the main conference is CVPR, who mo and most people probably haven't heard from CVPR, but this is the conference on computer vision. And if you look up on Google Scholar metrics that actually this year it has um, become number five in terms of impact uh, on Google Scholar. So uh, obviously the journals that you see is comparing apples with pears. I realize that as a, a former molecular, uh, as a molecular imaging researcher as well, but still it's, it's really important to see that um, uh, how, how big the impact of image analysis in, in many fields. And, and being good at methods um, uh, makes you really good at something, uh, not only publishing papers, but also global competitions. Because in this field, you can do one, you can join one competition and you can become world's best overnight without having any publications in the field. So that's really interesting. And we have um, showed that for different fields, for object detection, driverless car competitions, really global competition, taking taking up the biggest companies and the best teams and, and sometimes beating, uh, often beating them. And, um, and more in recent years, we have invested more in medical machine learning as well. Um, one of the projects, I cannot show all the projects, but we're trying to create a, a computer that can answer open-ended questions using so-called VQA, which is visual question answering, making computers understand questions uh, and not only answering cat or dog or yes or no, really understanding the question and then looking it up uh, and recognizing an image at the same time. Uh, we also have had relative success in colonoscopy, polyp detection, uh, where Professor Canero and Gabriel Makers were finalists in the Innovation Award. And we've also been part of many chapters and, and, and leading the field uh, uh, that is still finding its way uh, into clinical trials. One other big uh, foundation uh, of our success is industry collaboration. Our foundation partner is Lockheed Martin. Um, uh, so we do a lot of defense publishable defense research, and we work with the biggest companies, but also with a lot of small companies. Uh, like a local company, LBT Technologies, um, and, and that was one of the first medical successes where we helped develop the medical device, um, uh, which is an automated agar plate reader that can actually help microbiologists and outperform microbiologists in, in uh, detecting different bacteria on agar plates. And it's now for sale in Europe and the US, which is really unique and exciting in Australia, I think. We also helped the local company that's now actually bought into the US, but uh, to create an automatic bladder scanner. And, and this, this is really um, uh, the basis for something that has much more potential. If you're leading in computer vision and image analysis, I think uh, medicine should really uh, be be at the same could be at the same level, and that's uh, only through collaboration. And that's what I try to uh, one of my main messages of this uh, presentation as well. Um, we have defined some focus areas, uh, which could be machine learning and biology, uh, getting um, putting our teeth into omics data sets and image analysis. We look at clinical imaging, in intensive care data. Um, uh, robotics, uh, we have a center of excellence in robotic vision, which could help robotic surgery. Uh, big data and epidemiology, we have a lot of large registries and big data sets that, that are largely untouched, uh, at least uh, not using our methods. And then we're trying to push the limits also in creating new, uh, helping doctors um, uh, succeed and, and make diagnosis and make less mistakes and become more efficient and hopefully talk more to doctors, uh, to patients. 
So um, this team ha was really small two years ago and it's rapidly growing. All the students are not on there, but it's really thanks to all these guys that we are now pushing uh, different projects in, in imaging, in, in omics. Um, uh, we're just starting in genomics with the statewide genomics center and also in clinical trials center. Uh, clinical trials uh, um, uh, testing, we hope to predict uh, drugs better, uh, which will work uh, to, to, to that, so that everybody would spend less money on uh, development of drug and, and improving the time to market of any drug. So on that road, we need collaborators and we need people who have interesting questions, interesting data sets. And I plan to have this slide really full on the right. So the, the people in black and white are current collaborators. Um, I haven't added everybody, but I just put it there to show that we really are happy to collaborate with any specialty uh, and with anybody who has interesting questions and data sets that are amenable to our line of research. Um, what has, our, our approach has been successful in the sense that we have had success in MRFF grants to breast cancer uh, project uh, together with the group in Melbourne, uh, traumatic brain injury project, uh, Aboriginal and eye health, uh, early detection of that, and also uh, an NH and MSC partnership grant for AI decision support. Um, so, um, this is very important. Um, uh, I think we, we have the hospital, we have data, we have AI, and uh, because Mark was before me, uh, we have sensors, and I think that's really uh, where we can have an advantage over the rest of the world. If you ha integrate all these, you can actually make a difference. This is a slide where people, people can look at and look back and look at on the left, there's the Research Tuesdays, which gives a talk about medical machine learning, uh, an AI and medicine book, if you follow that link, and there's a few nice overview articles in um, Nature Medicine and New England Journal of Medicine. So I'm hereby I like to conclude for collaborations, grant proposals, data set, please contact us and um, I'm happy to uh, connect you to the right people or collaborate in general. Thanks very much. Thank you, Johan. Um, again, thanks so much for two fantastic presentations this afternoon. Again, it clearly shows the diversity of research that's underway in the Adelaide Biomed City. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to actually contact both Mark and Johan um, with any questions that you do have. And before we close off for this afternoon, given that we are run over time, I just want to remind people that these mini reviews are being recorded uh, and they are available from the Adelaide Biomed City website. Um, this is the Adelaide www.adelaidebiomedcity, one word, dot com, and it's under the banner webinars where you can also watch this and past webinar recordings. Um, I'd ask you to join us next week and uh, thank you for your participation this afternoon. Cheers.